Industrial Security Podcast with Andrew Ginter and Nate Nelson. Sponsored by Waterfall Security Solutions. Hey, sponsored by Waterfall Security Solutions. Hey, listeners, and welcome back to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm sitting with Andrew Ginter, the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. Andrew, how's it going? Very well. Thank you, Nate. We have two guests today. Ilan Gendelman is the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of SIGA OT Solutions. And Hadass Levine is the VP of Sales and Marketing at SIGA. I caught these gentlemen at the podcast Israel Media Offices, and we sat down and we sat down to discuss today's topic, intrusion monitoring at layer zero. Andrew, quickly before we begin, does SIGA stand for anything? Not as far as I know. As far as I know, it's just, you know, it's SIGA OT Solutions. Okay. Let's get to your interview with Hadas and Ilan. Uh, you've got some, some technology that works on the, the PLC level. Can you can you start us at the beginning? I mean, we've got a uh, a traditional control system. We've got PLCs. We might have safety systems. We have a, a distributed control system, a SCADA system. You know, eventually we might have historians. We might have connections to might have historians. We might have connections to the IT network. What problem do you solve? Where does where does your stuff fit? So all you mentioned, which is if you think in terms of security is in many in many ways identical to what you might discuss a little different than the IT world and in that sense just importing the same concept from the IT to the OT is giving uh, important critical solutions but not sufficient ones the core differences are those that implies what the problem is the first what are you trying to protect while in the IT world you're protecting data, all various aspects of data, here you're protecting the actual physical manifestation of all this computerized world, the actual process. And the actual process in the OT world, actual process in the OT world relies in very, very significant level, in the level zero of, of the diagram. And that's one thing. The second thing is the architecture is completely different. You have the specific layer of the PLCs which isolate completely a completely a barrier between what is the asset, the physical devices, and everything you mentioned which lives above it in kind of the IT layer of the OT. And if you take that with the aspect of who is the adversary and who is trying to and who is trying to compromise the system and using the, the concept that I think everybody agrees on that the PLCs will be breached. Once the layer one, the level one, the PLCs are breached, this allows an attacker allows an attacker for complete and without any time limit control over the asset, the real asset of the OT. So what I hear you saying is that PLCs are software. They're computers like other computers. They can be breached. The difference is that they're actually controlling the physical world one, because the PLC can now do bad things to your very costly, very, very valuable physical process. So SIGA has some technology here that deals with that. What do you have? Where does it fit? So I want even to uh, add to your description it's not only that probably any piece of software. What's unique about that, that the PLC is the only real piece of software that sees the actual process. And once it's breached, it's not only might do bad things, it will control fully what will be seen by any, will be seen by any system above, security, operational safety, anything above. That's part of the uniqueness. So. We aim the solution to focus on the asset, on the process. And we looked for ways, what's the ultimate way to actually, way to actually identify whether the process, the, the real asset of the OT layer 
is doing what it's supposed to do. So we are seated in the last point, in the last barrier, when the information is 100% true and untempered. Exactly as I said, where there is no computers yet seated on the lines between the PLCs and the sensors and actuators, duplicating the signal and using this unique information for all we do. So that's an interesting point that uh, Ilan made there. Um, the the PLC is not that you know can control the physical world. This is what everybody focuses on. It's also the device that can blind all of the rest of the system to what's happening in the physical world because the PLC is what translates physical readings into the the digital messaging that goes out on on networks and other systems can see. You know, it kind of recalls Stuxnet into the the digital messaging that goes out on on networks and other systems can see. You know, it kind of recalls Stuxnet and how the the people overseeing those subterfuges didn't know what was going on for months on end as the hackers were manipulating them. Precisely, precisely. So, you know, the the Stuxnet worm once it got into it recorded a bunch of normal readings and then started doing its damage but when anybody asked the plc what are your values it would replay those normal readings and so all the operators saw was green lights while things were blowing up in the uh, in the physical process and you know the other thing that, you know the other thing that i think is as we're talking about this stuff is is plcs you mentioned plcs are software and software to me always always seems like it's hackable so this the power of a plc to an attacker combined with the fact that it's basically just a computer program Ann's point is not that they have a hardware plc it's not that they have an unhackable plc what they're doing is you know their stuff is tapping into the hardware readings before those readings get to the plc and so their stuff cannot be fooled i think is the uh, the, the point he was making what what are those signals? I mean, I'm familiar with the, the, the 4 to 20 milliamp signaling system that PLCs use. Is that it? Are there other kinds of signaling that, that, that are involved there? What, what is that level? So again, the, the most common is the 4 to 20 milliamps and the um, 0 to 10 millivolts and the um, 0 to 10 millivolts for discrete information. That's the most common but we are not limited to any type of, of signal. We can duplicate any signal. We did very complex things using thermocouples. Uh, it's all a matter of duplicating signal in a way that 100% send information to us, being completely isolated from the system, but having the full scope of information in any resolution, in any sampling weight, we, we need it. That sounds very interesting, but uh, you know, can you give me the big picture? You've You've talked about gathering very low-level electrical signals to imagine uh, a piece of hardware that will gather the signal. What do you do with it? What's, what's the big picture? How does, that, how does that electric signal turn into useful information? So we, the full chain is starting from the uh, duplication, the secure duplication, transforming it this still analog information to digital information and log information to digital information, and that's the point where we can choose sampling and resolution. From that point, which is still in pretty much in the PLC's cabinet physically, we collect it on the local agent and securely send it to our analysis uh, server. The analysis server can be on pre the analysis server can be on prem, depending on client side. Can be cloud I mean, in our cloud. It can be in in the client's personal uh, private cloud, and that's where the real work starts. So that's where we focus. While we look on the product as the whole sequence, the actual work we do sequence, the actual work we do is with this information. How to use the unique attributes of information that represent process to bring the maximal benefit to the client in terms of security, but also in terms of operation. Okay, so um, you're so um, you're gathering the data, you're analyzing it. How do you know if it's right? I mean, the, the, the control system is uh, starting up a boiler and, you know, starting up the furnace and heating things up and starting to generate electric power. There's sensors all over a power plant or all over a refinery, a cattle. Uh, you know, the values are going up and down. If you're working with a copy of the information, how do you know 
what's supposed to be happening. So I, I can go back later to, to the other benefits, but your question is is touching the the most critical, the most advanced part of, of the solution is using the machine learning algorithm specifically to use information gathered for a period of time, which define either normal or partially normal, extract the normal parts of this information, and based on this information, build a, a valid barrier around what is normal. An alert once we, we see a an alert once we we see a deviation from that. Now, let me just a co small comment on this issue, because if you throw a stone to the internet pool, you'll see machine learning, anomaly detection, anything on the same, everybody's saying this. What we makes us very effective every day, our algorithms use on process deviation. Process deviation does not need to be security related. And in this sense, if once you install a security system and a, a network level security system, which is supposed to attack anomaly is on a network, on a network, how do you test it? You pen test it? Are you really going? Does a client really allow pen testing a live setup? In most cases, no. It will be tested in a lab once and that's it. We are tested every minute or every day because every small operational change that happens on the system, the clients, and that's it. We are tested every minute or every day because every small operational change that happens on the system, the client says, did you identify it? Did you not identify it? And that's one thing. The other thing, being an operational system, I mean, living in the same operational world of the pro, is how do we focus on a very, very low and contained level of false alerts Otherwise, an operational system on this, on the process level, becomes completely unusable if we are passing this threshold. So you have uh, a machine learning system. You know, the one of the goals, you know, the one of the goals of the machine learning system has to be to minimize false alarms. How do you do that? So we are saying more than just what you're saying that we need to minimize false alerts. Because anybody dealing with detection wants to minimize false alerts. Because we are seated where we're seated, because we're handling process level information, because we are not just cyber related, we are also operational related, a level of false alert that might be fully accepted on IT protection level cannot be accepted on operational level. So our, all, the, all our development is focused on how we meet what we do. We narrow the tunnel all the time. So we start at some point, and we aim to a specific level of false alert, the price of aiming to that is that we detect much less. We are ready not to detect some level of anomalies, level of anomalies on the process because we are not 100% sure in order to gain a low level of false alert. But as more information as we gather, it allows us to narrow this tunnel and to be more precise on the smaller deviation of the process while maintaining this while maintaining the same target false alert. Nate, what I found really interesting there, um, you know, harks back to my own experience ten years ago when I was building intrusion detection and, and you know security monitoring systems. The the constant challenge back here, um, a lot of which are log messages, a lot of which could translate into alerts. And you've got this constant tension between uh, false positives, which is false alarms, because your system is too sensitive, and false negatives, which is missing real attacks, because you made your system, you made your system uh, too, let's say, insensitive. Uh, you, you produce fewer false alarms, but you record fewer real attacks as well and this this tension you know between you know that it was constant adjustment that was needed because there's only so many alerts you can handle in a day you know you might say all i can handle is 20 alerts and adjustment that was needed because there's only so many alerts you can handle in a day you know you might say all i can handle is 20 alerts in a day that's all i have the means to investigate tuning the system to produce only 20 alerts was a real challenge and what i just heard uh elan say is that 
you know, they set that target in their system, the system tunes that target in their system, the system tunes itself and produces the desired number of alerts per day, you know, one per week, 20 per week, 20 per day, whatever, whatever you program that, that bit of, you know, that nugget of, of automation, I thought was, was uh, inspired. You know, I've, I've heard of this paradigm um, in the IT sense, you know, for example, large companies, um, those places are getting hit by, by cyber threats very frequently. And so there's this, this constant debate about if you tune it up, suddenly you have so many false alarms along with the real alarms that the people who are looking after this stuff become a little bit numb to all alarms. And then you have another security problem, constant cyber threats. So I imagine that this is a real issue. But I also have an image of my mind where ICS systems are more closed, that there's less sort of chaos going on day to day. So I'm surprised that this is an issue there as well. ICS systems generally are more closed, generally are more. If you're dealing with a refinery with, you know, 400 people on site every day, um, things are changing faster than in a, a, you know, a physically smaller site. But you also have the question of consequences, the consequences of compromise, shutting down a a billion dollar physical asset uh, for, you know, a day or two or serious consequence. And of course, there's, there's even worse possible. And so a lot of people want to increase the sensitivity of their security monitoring and intrusion detection systems, uh, much more so in these contained environments than they would want to do out on an IT network where there's constant change, constant change. And so if you increase the sensitivity, it starts producing false alarms again. So you have this problem in, in, in both uh, environments, in my experience. And I have another question about uh, something that you guys were talking about. To what extent is this process handled by a machine learning app people at computer monitors? Because I can imagine the application of machine learning here, um, but at the same time, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to trust it with the entire responsibility. You know, that's a good point too. What Elan did not say is they produce N alerts per week because that's their goal and the organization investigates those N alerts and nothing else. You know, if I were deploying this and I had the means to investigate, let's say, five alerts per week, I would make, uh, you know, set a goal of, uh, I don't know, 20 alerts per week and say to the machine learning algorithm, take your best shot, give of, uh, I don't know, 20 alerts per week and say to the machine learning algorithm, take your best shot, give me your best analysis. And when I see these alerts come up, I'm not going to go, you know, launch a, uh, you know, a potential intrusion investigation or any other kind of uh, anomaly investigation. The first thing I'm going to do is look at the alert, look at the alert and, you know, compare it to the other alerts that have come in this week and ask the machine, you know, what's the data look like? Why do you think we have a problem? And in a sense, second guess the machine. I'm going to pick my five out of the 20 the machine gives me. Um, but, you know, I am grateful that the machines, I am grateful that the machines give me 20 and not 2000 because I can filter five out of 20. I can't filter five out of 2000. Pick a, an industrial process that, that you folks you you know run into routinely. Uh, can you give me an example of, of what you would learn about it, and you know what what would constitute uh, producing an alert in that process? We are physically installed in various in, uh, industries which are completely different one from the other. We are installed in various uh, water facilities, uh, and while we installed in. Uh, in uh, gas turbine, in, in uh, electrical manufacturing, using the same set of algorithms, producing the same level of effective alerts. So if you're looking for a specific example, a very, very good example is a, a chemical process uh, uh, manufacturing. Uh, we have, for example, installation in bromide pro- uh, manufacturing. And what, for, and what, for example, comes an alert and again, we can discuss alerts because we are not limited to cyber. I mean, if you ask how many real cyber attacks reach the, the final level of it was hard to tell. But because we are looking on any operational uh, mis- on any operational uh, misfunction, we have dozens of, of examples. So, for example, we ha- we had a case where the bromide process worked as normal. Everything, nothing was alerted. But at some point, it's, it put a half weight 
to the uh, to the um, I don't know how you call it, uh, to the um, I don't know how you call it, the container there and then evacuate it and put it again and the whole process if you look at it on the end point was not notified was noticed but anyway on the PLC level on the HMI level on the on the actual process monitoring and the system alerted now this information went straight to the uh, operational guys on site allow them to see that at this point something went completely wrong of what they expected and there was no other tool that was alerting on that. So before we get deeper into this... It's, it's in the periodic table. Apparently the, uh, the, the most common use for bromine is as a fire retardant. And uh, it's because, you know, certain compounds with bromine in them, uh, you know, latch onto oxygen sort of more effectively than uh, hydrocarbons do. Hydrocarbons tend to be what's burning, um, burning, um, and it interrupts the uh, the chemical reaction that, that, that is the fire. Uh, bromine is, is produced worldwide, you, mostly out of saltwater deposits, uh, not necessarily the ocean, but, uh, you know, inland lakes like the, uh, you know, uh, the Salt Lake in the United States or the Dick in the United States or the Dead Sea in the Middle East um, tend to have higher concentrations of uh, and accessible concentrations of bromine. So, you know, this is the, uh, the, the process he's talking about is purifying bromine, I think, out of salt water. What I'm hearing you say is, is uh, you know, there's, there's two benefits to this. It goes physically wrong. It might be a result of malicious activity. You know, it might be a cyber hacker. It might be an insider who's, you know, got a screwdriver messing with things. Um, but it might also be, in a sense, normal errors and omissions. It might be, it might be wear and tear. It might be a problem. But, it, you know, it sounds like, you, you know, because you've got this machine learning going on, you're adding value in terms of, of you know, detecting any kind of, of unexpected anomaly. Well, I'll just add something that because of the fact that we're located where we are in the process and process and monitoring the electrical signals, the amount of data that we are exposed to or, ac or accumulating is far greater than what you'll see in upper layers. You have a filtering process that's going on and a data smoothing process that's occurring as the PLC, PLC is then taking the electrical signals and almost translating them, okay, and filtering the data as it goes upward in the process. So we're exposed and we have the availability of the totality of data because we see the electrical signals and we're operating on that basis. On that basis. So between that and the extreme, I would say, extreme sampling rates that we're able to achieve, relatively speaking, and especially when we talk about legacy systems, we're getting so much more information. So many times, this, this, I think this is almost a, an expected type of, occur type of occurrence that, that Elon just uh, related to in a bromine uh, manufacturing facility where basically the operators had no idea and they didn't see it in their system. It was literally lost in translation between the electrical signal and the data packets. Data packets. And if I go back to your question, this is, was exactly what we are saying. What you described is both allows us to bring much more value to the client upon installation and it keeps us much more on our toes in sense of in sense of being all the time uh, in actual work in progress and being all the time monitored in in the good sense now that was hadass uh, talking initially he did not say the words uh, industrial internet of things but to me application we have the ability he has the ability to do high res sampling of physical signals pump them out into the into the cloud lots of them drop a machine learning algorithm on top of it and draw useful conclusions i mean you know people have been talking about the inter the industrial internet of things for a long time there's the active examples of how to use this are few and far between i mean the classic example is predictive maintenance but here you've got an example of pushing the data in the cloud and drawing useful conclusions from it which which i found very interesting okay so um 
can we can we step back to the the even bigger picture? You've described te- technology for monitoring at the low level. You've described the uh, the machine learning engine, uh, an, an alerting system. These higher level systems, where are they typically installed? Is this an OT SOC? Are they connected to the IT SOC? Is it an operations thing other than a SOC? Who? thing other than a SOC? Who, who uses this information? How's it, how does it work at the high level? So one of the huge benefits of the type of connection that we're using is that by definition, this is an out-of-band connection. And this allows us to take any system, as sec- any system, as secure as this connected uh, as can be, and without any compromise to the system, pull this information and push it anywhere which is needed by the client. So we have a whole solution sending this information to a, be a cloud uh, server, a cloud uh, server to a SOC, which specifically built for the OT layer. And we have a solution which pushes to the SIM solution on-prem for, of, of the client. Uh, it can be visible both cloud-based by the SOC and by the client uh, on-prem. And we have a, a prem, and we have a, a solutions. I mean, we have installations where information is uh, sent to uh, to government agencies for uh, gathering and collecting in parallel to the information. I think what what I'm hearing you say is that the uh, the network your equipment is the network your equipment is deployed on is not the same as the OT network. You've got your own network going. You've got some isolation there. I'll just add that um, being out of band, I think, is really the most important point here. What network we're in, that's we, we're completely, we can work with any or various different types of, of networks, but what's really important is the fact that we're out of band. But I think that the fact that the network is l- less important, really, than the fact that we're completely out of band, unreachable, and basically, as a result of that, also unhackable. So in, in addition to what I'm saying, not only unnoticeable, so any intruder on the operational level cannot say one way or the other whether the system is protected or not by SIGA. And related again to what Hadass was saying, in real life, and we have personal experience in that, in real life events, cyber events on OT layer, cyber events on OT layer, the all the information that at this point now relies on the historian or any accumulated is considered to be compromised. So it's, it makes the forensic almost impossible to understand what really happened. Even once the intrusion was identified and, and stopped, it's very, very hard to analyze going back what exactly was happening at which, at which point on the most critical OI process layer. Andrew, anytime anybody says the word unhackable, I clench a little bit. Yeah, that, I think that's a little bit of market speak. And what I took out of his answer is that the most useful way in, from, a, from, a, from a security perspective to arrange the flow of information is to have the SIGA equipment report to, let's call it the, you know, the big data cloud on the internet through a communication channel, a separate communication channel, independent from the cloud on the internet, through a communication channel, a separate communication channel, independent from the control system network, the IT network, and you know, out to the internet. If you've got a separate communications channel going there, um, now the bad guys, let's say they get into operations and they start stirring the pot with PLCs, they look around. How can they tell that their activity is being monitored at the physical layer by the SIGA systems? Well, they can't. There's no indication of that layer of that that monitoring in the process because it's happening at the the physical layer, and you know, to me, that's that's the the logical way to be interested in insights into operations. You can arrange it any way you want, but for security benefits, you do it. To me, that's that's what out of band means. It means you're on a different network. You know, in the words of radio frequency, you're on a different band. Nobody, you know, you're not interfering with the main stuff. You're communicating in a different way with different systems and different systems, and nobody can tell you're there. Okay, but what I'm still a little bit unclear on is, is it not possible to imagine an attack that comes in from the internet through the SIGA equipment 
to modify these physical processes? Well, it's it's certainly theoretically possible. I mean, anything that's connected is two answers here. One is that um, the SIGA equipment, the fact that it's monitoring a physical process is invisible to the process. And so it's it's hard to tell this is going on. It's hard even to, to, to understand where to look for that if you wanted to try and interfere with it. And, you know, the second point is that it doubles the, the cost of your attack. Now you don't have to, if you want, you don't have to, if you want, you know, if you know that SIGA is involved, now you've got to hack SIGA and you've got to hack your target. You know, the, the name of the game in security is making things harder to do, much harder to do. But to your question of could the SIGA communication channels themselves be an opportunity to modify the, modify the physical process? I think the answer is no. In my understanding, uh, you know, what I got from, from their description is that the mechanisms that they use to tap into the 4 to 20 milliamp loops and the 0 to 10 millivolt um, signaling systems is physically one way. Even if you hack, even in the worst case, if you, even in the worst case, if you hack the SIGA equipment, it's not physically possible to modify the, the, the process. You cannot send a physical signal back into the process. It's physically a, a monitor-only interface, which is, in my books, you know, the right way to do this. Okay, let's get back to your interview. So this all sounds very interesting, but, you know, can you compare... Uh, your system to uh, sort of a classic defense in-depth model. You've got perimeter protection, there's intrusion detection, there might be anti-malware. There's, there's a whole range of, of systems installed on these, these OT networks. Where do you fit? Do you repla- replace one or more of these systems? Do you augment them? How, how do you fit in defense in-depth? So all of what you ma- mentioned are very important a uh, part of protecting the OT uh, ecosystem. And it's a complex environment to protect. And all you just men- all you just mentioned is seated in the kind of IT layer or a level of the OT and network related and and network entities related and aimed mainly to protect an attacker to reach and affect the actual process. And it's basically and it's basically building high walls around those uh, this uh, OT ecosystem. And those high walls are important. They must be in place. What we are saying that while they are in place, an attacker, a determined attacker as the OT uh, environment is, is looking at is, is looking at will pass those walls and will reach the PLC level. And once the PLC level is compromised, Everything there is inefficient, has no value at all, and what is exposed is the actual asset, the actual process. So we are closing, closing this main core of what is important, the process itself, working in parallel, in addition to the existing solution, building a whole complete ecosystem around, a protective ecosystem around the OT environment. So how are you getting the most excited about these capabilities? So on one hand, obviously the cybersecurity is screaming, uh, again, because of the fact we're out of ban and all the basic uh, attributes that we have there. But having this much data at our disposal, if you will, allows us to go into very, very many times manufacturing processes and provide them insight and, and benefit. Um, we've seen that several in several different applications. One was in a silicon wafer manufacturing operation, for example, where the batches are very sensitive both in terms of time and cost of pr- uh, production time and uh, sensitivity in terms of time to delivery, in terms of time to delivery, et cetera, uh, where we're able to see and help them in, in those type of situations. Uh, many times we see that in critical infrastructure as well, not from a cybersecurity standpoint necessarily, but just from a uh, operational reliability and process optimization, uh, optimization standpoint, optimization standpoint. Um, <coughs> we see that almost in, in most facilities that are involved with, again, I call critical infrastructure, which includes beyond just power and energy supply, but also water is such a critical, critical area. And we're able then to 
help those facilities in terms of of optimizing basically their operations, whether it be identifying, for example, in one facility a pump that was not pumping the required quantities and, again, was basically below the radar that the normal SCADA system was able to, to detect, but we're seeing deeper into that. In one case, we were called in one case, we were called in to assist an electrical uh, corporation, a utility company, to help them determine where, why they weren't able to ignite, basically, a gas-fired turbine. And um, we were brought into the facility. They were looking already for quite some time. They were looking, they were looking at a substantial period of downtime where a generator was basically offline with uh, basically tearing down the system stage by stage. And we were actually applied, and we were able to determine exactly the point of anomaly uh, within the first day of our, of our application to that particular site, to that particular site. So when I listened to Hadass there, uh, one of the things that struck me was that um, this technology is a good fit for very fussy physical processes. You know, the, the technology, the SIGA technology, taps into the, the physical signals. The, one of these control systems, he gave the example of a, a, a semiconductor fab. This is a very fussy system. You know, some control systems are designed to very fine tolerances, and the smallest change is going to set them off their pace and, and, and risk a shutdown. You know, changes as simple as put a new machine on the network, send a few new messages across the network, put a little bit of software on one of the machines that's already on the network. Any kind of change like this risks uh, messing up the, the, the logic of the control system. And one of the beauties of the SIGA system is that it's completely outside that. And even if you have a fussy control system, you can still install this stuff. As someone who's who's struggled, one who's who's struggled with fussy control systems for most of my career, you know, to me this is a big benefit. And when Hadass was talking about igniting the natural gas turbine, can you can you give me detail about how that actually happens? Yeah, so um, he talked about igniting a turbine, and you know, you you don't ignite uh, ignite a natural gas turbine, uh, or you know, in theory, you ignite a jet turbine. But basically, you know. I, I didn't ask, but I'm guessing he's talking about a uh, a natural gas power plant. Uh, a natural gas, you know, the, the the generator is connected with an axle, you know, a rod of of metal that's spinning, to basically a gas. You know, the, the the generator is connected with an axle, you know, a rod of of metal that's spinning, to basically a stationary jet engine that you pump natural gas in. You ignite it, and you have a very very noisy. Uh, spinning you know source of of uh, rotational energy that spins the jet things are big these things are complicated and you know he described a scenario where they couldn't get the thing lit you know i assume the control system is saying well you know there's 500 sensors on the thing here's the current value of each of the sensors but the process of lighting the thing you know i would imagine takes only a fraction of a second you know the control system is not giving the 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 operators enough insight into what's happening to be able to diagnose the physical problem and uh, you know what i heard the siga what i heard it ask say was that the the siga stuff very quickly because it was physically sampling at a very high rate very quickly gave the engineers the insight into insight into oh these three sensors, I can see the problem right now. The time trace, it's not supposed to look like this. It's supposed to look like that. You know, fix the problem and, and, and get going. So, uh, again, it's an example of where you can use very fine-grained information to gain operational benefits, you know, in addition to, you know, this is the induction to, you know, this is the industrial security podcast, in addition to the, the security benefits. All right, let's get to the end of your interview. We like to leave our guests with the last word. Is there a thought you'd like to leave with our listeners? Yeah, I think that uh, in general, uh, I think we need to be very careful not to make. Uh, I think we need to be very careful not to make assumptions. We need to always monitor and see in real time what the actual end device or apparatus is doing. We've seen crashes of airplanes recently. We've seen a lot of other types of time on the device itself and see exactly what's going on with that device. What's interesting about this technology is that it allows us to do that, whereas the present approach right now, especially when we look at the Purdue model, we're very, very focused on upper layers, 
But the question is, are we giving the due attention? Basically, I think that this technology really fills a very, very needed gap and void in our present approach to monitoring OT systems. So I noticed Tadas say that, you know, we're not really thinking enough about protecting endpoint devices. Is that really true? From my perspective, we've spoken perspective, we've spoken to at least a, a couple of guests who have been uh, interested in that very matter. I think it's it's unfair to say that that nobody's interested in protecting the endpoints. I think it's you know all of the layers of protection that the, that the Purdue model affords um, is designed to put protection. The, the that the Purdue model affords um, is designed to protect you know to prevent misoperation of the PLCs. Uh, but I think you know to Hadassah's point, it is fair to say that. If an intruder gets close to the PLCs, almost none of these PLCs have any built. Almost none of these PLCs have any built-in, any any you know significant built-in security features. And and often, if they have security features, they've been disabled because they they interfere with operations, or because it's there. It, there's a concern that they might interfere with operations, or you know just because there's a concern that this has added complexity, a network where we really need to understand what's happening in order to control the physical process correctly. So, you know, the PLCs are soft targets, most of them, once you get close to them for, for a variety of reasons. But, you know, what I took away from the uh, the from his comments it was more the, the um, you know, when the investigators got hold of the black boxes and tried to figure out what happened, well, what evidence did they have? They had the conversations between the pilots. That's one kind of evidence that the black boxes preserve. But they also had evidence from the sensors. The black boxes in these uh, aircraft uh, aircraft um, record a lot of sensor readings and a lot of information about what the computer is doing second by second. And so they could presumably see things like, um, hey, you know, this sensor started giving a different reading than that sensor. The pilot overrode it and raised the nose again, and then the sensor thing, the, you know, the autopilot kicked in again. This kind of detailed recording of, you know, second by second what's happening in a physical process um, is is very important to engineers who are trying to diagnose problems with the physical process, whether those problems be, you know, are, are malicious actors or not, um, you know, it's it's physical recordings. It's uh, in a sense, it's all the same to the to the solution that's that's doing the recording. So, um, you know, I thought that was a an, an apt uh, analogy there. Okay, and that'll just about do it for us today. Thanks to Elon and Hadas for sitting down with you, and thank you, Andrew, for sitting down with me. Thank you, Nate. We'll catch you next time. This has once again been the Industrial Security Podcast. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>